So chapter five focuses specifically on the structure and function of plasma membranes. A lot of the concepts in here though will also apply to other membranes like within a eukaryotic cell, for example. The first list here are the main components of the um, cell membrane. You have the phospholipid bilayer, and we will look at a diagram that shows that. Um, you have integral and transmembrane proteins. On the inner side of the surface, on the inner surface of the cell membrane, you have the cytoskeleton, which is connected to what we call peripheral proteins. And then on the outer surface of the cell membrane, you have um, cell surface markers, which are what we usually call antigens. Those are glycoproteins and glycolipids. And I would also mention that within the phospholipid bilayer, you have cholesterol as a part of that hydrophobic portion of the membrane. So this slide shows those components, those main components of the membrane, um, in what we call the fluid mosaic model. Before we had really good electron microscopes, there were different ideas or hypotheses about how the membrane structure was actually arranged. And with research, and we collected data and we were able to get good micrographs using electron microscopes, we were able to come up with the, what we believe is the correct model of the membrane and it's called the fluid mosaic model. And the fluid mosaic model um, is depicted here, although you don't get to see the dynamic movement of the components of the membrane because they're not just static, they don't just stay frozen in in their locations, the individual components can move around. So the phospholipids, you have the heads shown here in orange, are either facing the outer surface of the cell, which in this image is shown above, or you have another layer of phospholipid heads that's facing the inner surface of the cell, which is down. And then the hydrophobic tails are in the middle, and that makes the, the layer that's impermeable to liquid. So liquids are, that are supposed to stay out of the cell stay out. Liquids that are supposed to stay in the cell stay in. And then molecules can move across the membrane by different methods. One method is these pore proteins, these transmembrane proteins shown in blue. Um, but there are other ways that things can get across the membrane. We'll talk about that in this chapter how things move across the membrane, because the cell is not a closed system. There has to be movement of energy and materials from the outside of environment into the cell and from the inside of the cell back out into the environment. Um, you can also see here, that, like I mentioned, cholesterol, which is shown. You see these yellow, these fused rings. The yellow fused ring structure is the cholesterol right here. For example. Um, and then in blue you have what we call integral and transmembrane proteins and some of them have pores, little channels that allow things to pass through. Not all of them have that, but some of them do. On the outer surface you see to some of these transmembrane proteins you see little carbohydrate attachments, little chains of sugars. And if the sugar, if the chain of sugars is attached to a protein, it's called a glycoprotein. So the root or the prefix glyco means some kind of short chain of sugars. It's, it's not very specific, but it just means a short chain, a uh, little short carbohydrate. If you have a glycolipid, similarly, that means you have a short chain of sugars attached to some type of lipid. All right. And then on the inner surface, you can see the cytoskeleton here, the microfilaments that do attach to some of the proteins shown in blue and that would be on the inside surface of the membrane. But these components, especially the phospholipids and the membrane proteins and the cholesterol, these things move around. So anything that's facing, I guess in this image, like the phospholipid heads facing up, so facing towards the outside of the cell, they always stay in that same orientation, but they can move laterally around each other. 
So they can slide around each other, kind of like if you're in a very crowded space, you still stay with your head up and your feet down, but you can slide around each other in a really crowded space. And in the same way, all of the components, they stay in the same orientation, but they can move around each other. On the other layer, which has sort of the heads facing down, those components can also slide around each other without changing their orientation, but they can move around each other as if they're all in a crowded space. And so this is not um, a fixed structure. Each component is not covalently connected to the next, and so they can move around each other. And that's why it's called fluid. It's called mosaic because there's, you know, the way the proteins are um, is sort of haphazard and scattered in some sense, or at least at the time when they made up the name for this model, they thought so. And so the, it, really the mosaicism has to do with how the proteins are distributed and the fact that what you would see looking from the outside of the cell towards the surface would not be exactly the same as what you would see if you were looking from the inside um, of the cell at that same section of, pro of membrane. Because some of the proteins, as you can see here, don't poke all the way through. So on some, if you're looking from the inside of the cell at this surface, it would the proteins you would see would be a little different than if you're looking from the outside of the cell at this surface. So it gives a kind of mosaic, kind of refers to kind of the, the not, it's not an absolute pattern um, of what you would see on both sides. And they are also then moving around. So you get that sense. Just to review, phospholipids are what we call amphipathic molecules. So this may be a new term, but they have a, anything that's an amphipathic molecule, it means it has hydrophobic parts, distinctively hydrophobic parts, and distinctively hydrophilic parts. I said that in the opposite order. Hydrophilic head, hydrophobic tails. So a phospholipid is amphipathic. It has both, both chemistries or both behaviors because it's a large molecule. Most large molecules, a lot of large molecules, are going to have sort of this um, amphipathic nature. Um, and when you put a whole bunch of phospholipids into a liquid environment, into an aqueous environment, um, which is a liquid-based solution in biology, that's, you know, a water-based solution is the only one that's relevant, the phospholipids will spontaneously arrange themselves into the bilayer. And so there's also another structure called the single lipid sphere, or what's sometimes called the micelle. Uh, I've seen it spelled either M-I-C-E-L-L-E -E or M-Y, so now I can't remember which one's correct, but the micelle is really not biologically important to us, so it really doesn't matter if I can't spell it. So the lipid bilayer sphere is almost, you can imagine, like the whole cell, of course this one is kind of small, but you're, that's what the whole plasma membrane would be, and this one has been sliced in half, but you have this whole layer of heads all the way around the sphere that face the outer environment, but you have another whole layer of heads that face the inner environment of the cell. So all the contents of the cell would be in sort of in this space here. That is a biologically important structure. So the micelle is not important. The lipid bilayer is important. And we said that the model for the membrane is called the fluid mosaic model. And there's a very a famous experiment that was done to determine if the components of the membranes are able to move or do they stay fixed in their locations. What they did was, in this case, they took a human cell and a mouse cell and they were able to put a fluorescent dye on the protein components of each cell. So the human cell had a fluorescent dye uh, blue fluorescent dye in this picture, and the mouse cell had a red fluorescent dye on its membrane proteins. And then using a little bit of um, detergent, um, research grade kind of detergent, you can cause the 
cell membranes to fuse together like two soap bubbles. And then they waited and they allowed time to pass and then they viewed the fused cells, which is now like one bigger cell. They viewed them under the microscope and what they wanted to know was, you know, after the cells fused, would, would, the, would like all the blue proteins stay on one hemisphere and all the red proteins would just stay on the other hemisphere and it would just kind of stay fixed like that? Or would they move around? And in fact, they did move around. So when they saw this result, they saw that the proteins had, had moved, they knew that the components can move through the membrane. And, and similar experiments were done with phospholipids, although not this one in particular. So they were able to show in this experiment and others that the membrane proteins and the lipids can move. Mostly they move laterally. They don't, they don't, if they're facing the outside, they typically stay facing the outside environment. Or if they're facing the inside environment, they stay facing the inside environment. They can flip, but it's really rare, so we don't, we don't really worry about it. So what are these, these words I've been using? Integral proteins. An integral protein means it, it goes at least partially into the hydrophobic part of the membrane. So if it's integral, it, it goes, it extends into that middle core hydrophobic section of the membrane. If it goes all the way across, if it pokes all the way out on both sides, then we also call it transmembrane. So earlier there was a diagram of the phospholipid bilayer, and then there was one protein that was just kind of on one, it was, it was kind of in, here I'm showing it here. That one would have been integral, but not transmembrane. It would have to go all the way across and poke out on both sides to be transmembrane. Trans means goes all the way across the membrane, and in this sense it means clearly pokes out on both sides. So this one would just be integral. This one would be integral, but you could also use the term transmembrane, I, T, all right? And the part that goes across the membrane is called the transmembrane domain. Now, usually the transmembrane domain, that part of the protein that goes into the hydrophobic section, it's often made of either alpha helix. So in this picture, this purple thing is actually supposed to indicate cylinder shape indicates the alpha helix. You remember the alpha helix is a spiraling shape. It's a secondary structure. And then the, um, this one would be three alpha helices back and forth. And then also sometimes you see beta sheets in that transmembrane part of the protein. So the, the beta sheets, remember, are kind of the folded zigzaggy parts of a secondary structure. And so in this picture, they're, so, they're kind of um, shown in, as a blue square. But the um, alpha helix or the beta sheets help to help the protein um, be embedded across that membrane. And some transmembrane proteins are just solid, and some of them actually create a hollow space, which we call a pore. You'll remember the pores in the nuclear membrane. So those pores are made of these kinds of proteins. And a lot of pores, not all, but a lot of pores are made of what we call the beta barrel structure. It's a whole bunch of beta sheets. In this image you can see, and it, it's like the beta sheets are stacked up like a, a barrel, like an actual barrel structure. In this picture here you saw it also, this, there's, this is actually showing a beta barrel. But it's not uncommon to find a pore protein that has that structure that goes across the membrane. And what, what it does is it's, here you're looking from the side view, but if you were looking from above, you would see an empty hole, or if you were looking from below. So you see a, an, a passage, I think. Uh, it's hard to, hard to get your eye right there, but if you had a camera that little, you would see a space passageway across the membrane. All right, now what about this thing called glycoproteins and glycolipids? These are, this picture you're supposed to see, this is the, the bilayer shown here in purple. 
This is supposed to be the bilayer. And then you can see some proteins that are just transmembrane, like this one here and this one here. But this one here, they're emphasizing because it's a particular protein called CD4. But it's just a protein. It may, uh, in this picture, it may have um, sugars attached. And what what really what glycoproteins and glycolipids do is it allows the immune system to recognize what we call self. And so all of your cells have glycoproteins and glycolipids, but the ones that my cells have, some of my glycoproteins and glycolipids might be the same as yours, but some of mine are different. So there's lots of them. And that's why it's hard to, to match somebody because if you were doing a, a tissue transplant of some kind of transplant, you have to match the person who's providing the transplant and the person who's receiving the transplant have to match on all of their antigens, on all of their glycoproteins and glycolipids. It's almost impossible to do unless you are an identical twin. But that would be, per, uh, that would be a perfect match. You almost never can get a perfect match. So then what they do is they try to find somebody who has a lot of the same ones. But usually when they do that, it's, it, you know, the body will eventually figure out that it's not, that that transplanted tissue should not be there and it attacks it. And that's called rejection. Uh, how quickly the body rejects depends on how good of a match there is. If it's a perfect match, the body should not reject. But like I said, there's almost never a perfect match. The other thing that these, um, these glycoproteins and glycolipids are, are used for, however, for example, uh, in this image you see HIV uses some of these to actually bind to your cells. So viruses will use the same things to bind to your cells. Um, and so um, they're, they're useful as what we call antigens, meaning like tissue types. Um, it helps your body recognize what should be there because your body goes around, your, your white blood cells go around to each cell and it senses all the glycoproteins and glycolipids that are there and it says, okay, that's good, that's supposed to be there. And then it goes on to the next cell and does the same thing. And when it, if it gets to a cell that has glycoproteins or glycolipids that are wrong, that are not supposed to be in your body, then it mounts a, an attack on that cell, on that tissue. And so that's how, I mean, fundamentally, that's how your immune system works. And, um, but like I said, in some cases, the um, viruses use those same proteins to enter your cells. So it can get really interesting there. All right, but let's talk about how things get across membranes. We've talked about the structure of membrane quite a bit. We've talked about how the components, some of them are able to move around. But let's talk about the, um, how... Um, how things get across membranes. The fundamental rule of, of movement of molecules in the universe is um, one based on a concept called diffusion. All right, And diffusion is defined here, you need to memorize this, the movement of any particle molecule from an area of its higher concentration to the area of its lower concentration. In other words, the concentration of that molecule being higher in one place and lower in another place will drive the movement from the higher concentration area to the lower concentration area. And that movement continues until the concentration is even everywhere. This kind of movement is called passive. It does not require an input of energy. All right. And we call the direction of movement, we call that, we say that the diffusion moves with the concentration gradient or along the concentration gradient. So the concentration gradient is always from higher to lower. That's the concentration gradient, higher to lower. So if we say that a molecule moves with the gradient, we're saying it moves from higher, it's its area of higher concentration to its area of lower concentration. So that would be moving with the gradient, or we could say moving along the gradient. The opposite of this is if you have something that's moved against the gradient or up the gradient. Oh, I forgot to mention, you can say down the gradient. 
So if you're moving along the gradient, or with the gradient, or down the gradient, that would all be, that would all mean the same thing, along, with, or down. So diffusion is in the movement of something along the gradient, with the gradient, or down the gradient. So those three things mean the same thing. The opposite of that is moving against a gradient or moving up a gradient. But that would not be passive transport. Passive transport is moving along a gradient, with a gradient, or down a gradient. So diffusion is passive. No energy is required. It happens naturally. This is the natural direction of movement of things in the universe. Um, well, without any energy having to be put in. So, simple diffusion. There aren't very many things that can diffuse across a membrane. And for us, the membrane is going to be key because all cells have membrane and cell is the important structure for biology. So, in this picture, first of all, this is not glucose. I hate this picture because they put a hexagon and they should have known better. A hexagon has an, a connotation to biochemists that it would be representing glucose. So this is not supposed to be glucose, just so you know that. Um, this could be oxygen. This could be carbon dioxide. Let's, let's do that. So think about oxygen or carbon dioxide. Oxygen and carbon dioxide can go across a membrane without any assistance. All right. And so pretend like this is oxygen or carbon dioxide. Um, what will happen is, let's say you have a lot of oxygen on the outside of the cell. It's called the extracellular space. And you have less oxygen inside the cell. So the direction of the gradient would always be from the area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration. So the direction of movement would be this way if diffusion was acting. Well, diffusion is always acting. It's the rule of the, um, of the universe. So as long as this object can go across the membrane, which it can, oxygen and carbon dioxide can go directly across the membrane, then what will happen is, this is sort of supposed to be a time lapse. So here's time. Time is zero, time is one, time is two, whatever. So in this, in, at time zero, the gradient is very strong. You have a lot of concentration outside the cell, nothing inside the cell. At time one, some things have already started to move across the membrane. And by time two, it's finished. Like now it's equal across both sides. So now there is no gradient. The gradient is, has disappeared because the concentration has evened out across the membrane, and so diffusion is done. But this would be the gradient is most easily seen at time zero. So because the, the oxygen is going to move from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, there's no energy that's needed because that is the natural movement that is passive transport. So oxygen and carbon dioxide go into your cells this way, or they also can go outside of, out of your cells. So let's say a lot of carbon dioxide builds up inside the cell, and there's not as much on the outside of the cell, then carbon dioxide would move from the inside out, because in that case, its gradient would be in that direction. Higher concentration of CO2 inside the cell, less outside, so the gradient would move it out. And this is true in, the, in your cells. There's always a gradient of moving oxygen into your cells, and there's always a gradient moving carbon dioxide out. And the same thing in your body, right? We're always breathing in oxygen and breathing out the CO2, but we're focusing more on the individual cell in this concept. Now, there are molecules that cannot cross the membrane by simple diffusion. So oxygen and CO2 can. Anything else, pretty much anything else cannot. And so most things you can pretty much assume it's going to need some kind of help. Help is facilitation. 
So you have facilitated diffusion, which means diffusion, something going from its area of higher concentration to its area of lower concentration, but it needs the help of some kind of transmembrane protein. And so that's called facilitated diffusion, when a transmembrane protein allows that movement to happen. So the, the transmembrane protein, we can call it a channel or a carrier. The, the difference there is a channel basically is like a, is like a tube. It's open. It has a certain shape, so only the, the molecule of the correct shape can go through, but as long as it's the correct shape, it just goes straight through. I like to think of those um, toys when you were a child. There's a toy called a shape sorter, and it's usually some kind of container, and it has a slot in the top. And one of the holes is shaped like a star, and one of the holes is shaped like a circle, and one of the holes is shaped like a square. And then you have these little blocks, and one of the blocks is a star. And so the star can go through the star hole, and the square can go through the square hole, and the circle can go through the circle hole. But the hole is open. As long as the shape is the right shape, the hole stays open. So a, a channel protein is like a hole. It's a certain shape, but it just stays open, so things can go through if it's the right shape. So in this picture, you have, um, let's say you have more of these green hexagons and on this side, so more, more green hexagons on this side of the membrane, less of the green hexagons on this side, so diffusion would want to move it this way, but if it can't go directly across the membrane, it's going to need the help of a channel protein. As long as the channel protein is open and it's there, then it can go. And then this will continue until there's an equal amount of green hexagons on both sides of the membrane, inside the cell and outside the cell. A carrier protein is also helps with diffusion. The only difference with a carrier protein is shown here, and you can see this is kind of like a time lapse again. This is time zero, and this is time one, and this is time two. So at time zero, you can kind of see the, the protein is kind of closed on this side, but kind of open on the outside. And then this little, um, let's say it has a, a, a hole that's the right shape for this oval molecule. So the oval molecule comes in, and then the carrier protein changes shape, and you see how it sort of flips and it closes on the outside but it opens on the inside, almost like a revolving door or, I don't know. Anyway, so it's, it's open on the outside, and then when, once the little molecule comes in, it flips. And then it flips back. It keeps, you know, keeps doing it. So in the end, the, the, the uh, oval is moving from its area of higher concentration. Let's say in this picture it seems to be on the outside here and then it ends up moving towards its area of lesser concentration. And the only difference here is that a carrier protein changes shape while it's doing that, whereas a channel protein is typically associated with the idea of it just staying open on both ends. It's a minor difference. There's also some terminology that's related to how things are moving. If you have only one thing, like we've only seen one thing moving at a time, if you have a channel protein or a carrier protein, any kind of protein um, that's moving, allowing movement across a membrane, if it just allows one thing to move across, that's called a uniporter. So the movement of one thing through that hole is called uniport. If it can take two things, but they go in the same direction when they get transported, that can be called symport. If it can move two different things across, but it moves them in opposite directions, this has to do with all, all of this has to do with direction, it's called antiport. So uniport is one thing moving only in one direction. Symport would be two molecules, different molecules moving in the same direction. Antiport would be two molecules moving in opposite directions.
right? Now, that, that only has to do with direction. Now, you also have active transport is the opposite of passive transport. So passive transport is when something moves along the gradient, with the gradient, or down the gradient. And no energy is required for passive transport. Active transport is the opposite. Active transport is when something moves against its gradient or up its gradient. And it, passive transport requires no energy. Active transport requires energy because you're going against the force of diffusion or against the natural direction of the universe. Anytime you move against the natural direction of the universe, you're going to have to put energy in to achieve that. All right. Now, for active transport, you're always going to have to have some kind of protein. And um, it's always going to have to be a carrier, not a channel. We usually use the term pump. When we get to active transport, one, one clue, if you see the word pump, that would describe a transmembrane protein that's moving something against its gradient. Anytime you use a pump, you're moving some, you're forcing something to go in a direction that it doesn't necessarily want to go naturally, because diffusion is the natural direction. So the classic example of a pump is called the sodium potassium pump. All right, so this is classic. This is always the example that they use. So first of all, this is a carrier protein. And the way I know it's a carrier protein is, or is, is and this is a time lapse again. This is time zero here. Here's time one, time two, and then you go back to time zero, I guess. Uh, it just repeats. So at time zero, you have the carrier protein is open on the inside of the cell. And the... Sodium, which are these little orange shapes, go into the carrier protein. And then the carrier protein changes shape. So that's how you know it's a carrier, not a pore, or a channel, I should say. And when it changes shape, it releases those sodiums to the outside of the cell. And while it's open to the outside of the cell, it picks up some potassium. And then when it flips back to its original shape it releases the potassium out and then it and then it repeats so it's pushing sodium out and potassium in and the important thing here is first of all it's a it's a carrier because it changes shape so that word would 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 apply um, it is moving things against the gradient. And they give you the gradient over here on the right. Sodium, where it's darker, that means more. So there's more sodium on the outside of the cell and less on the inside. So the darker red, more on the outside, less on the inside. And so sodium, the gradient actually goes in this direction. It goes from the higher concentration to the lower. And so you can see that sodium is moving against the gradient. The gradient is shown here in this scale on the right. The gradient diffusion should move sodium from the outside of the cell in. But in this case, where the carrier protein is moving the sodium from the inside of the cell out. So it's actually going against the gradient. So that means it's active transport. The potassium has a different gradient. The gradient of the potassium is higher on the inside of the cell than on the outside. And so again, diffusion would move potassium out, but in fact, potassium is being moved in. So both of the movements are active transport. The movement of the sodium against its gradient and the movement of the potassium against its gradient. Um, ATP is broken down, hydrolysis of ATP into ADP plus inorganic phosphate provides the energy needed for this. So ATP is the energy source. And then I ask you this question. Is it a uniport, a symport, or an antiport? Remember, uniport would be one molecule being moved across. Clearly, this is two. 
they're not molecules, but one, one item. These are ions. Symport would be two being moved across in the same direction. Antiport would be opposite direction. So this would be an antiport. So antiport would be a word that would work. Active transport focuses on a different aspect. Carrier protein. So different terms that are um, focusing on different aspects of this entire process. All right, what do you think about this one? This is a, a picture in your book. This is sodium is higher on the outside, lower on the inside, and glucose is lower on the outside. They didn't show you the glucose concentration, but you can kind of tell. Glucose is this, what is this, a little um, rectangle. Glucose is lower on the outside and higher on the inside. The glucose is being moved against its gradient. Sodium is being moved along its gradient. So there's one active transport and there's one passive transport happening. But they're both being moved in the same direction, so that would be symport. And you really can't tell, but this is um, a carrier protein. It's a weird way of showing a carrier protein, but it is changing shape as it's completing the transport. So there's different terms you can use. The active and the passive has to do with, is it being moved with the gradient, along the gradient, or down the gradient? Or is it being moved against its gradient or up the gradient? Passive would be with the gradient. Active would be against the gradient. And then uniport, symport, and antiport have to do with the direction and the number of, of items that's being moved. Now, one thing that you will study in a, a future class is that the, these pumps and these channel proteins and these carrier proteins work in combinations. They're not just individual. They work in different combinations to create an electrical charge across a membrane. And what that means is you might know a little bit about how a battery works. Um, if you have a lot of negative charges on one end and a lot of positive charges on the other end. If you connect those two things with a wire, the negative charges will, the electrons will flow across the wire towards the positive end. That's what a battery does. And that flow of electrons is electricity. And your neurons work very much in the same way. These pumps that are in your membranes, especially in neurons, but all of your cells have it, um, create a buildup of positive charge on one side of the membrane and negative charge on the other side of the membrane and that's like a little battery and then the way a neuron fires the way a neuron works is by um, releasing or allowing that flow across, back across the membrane and it's like an electrical system in your body it is an electrical system in your body because if you get hit by lightning what happens is it completely blows out all your all your wiring but you don't really have wiring, you have neurons. But it blows out all your electrical systems in, a, in that same sense, just like it would in your house. And if you stick your finger in a light socket, it, it messes up all your neurons. So that's why, because this is how your neurons work. It works on a fundamental concept of how electricity works. So when you take physics, the second semester of physics, uh, it's usually a lot about electricity. Um, it has a lot to do with this physiology, the neural physiology. So some of you are interested in neuroscience. When you take that physics too, try to think about it in terms of the biology because your, your teacher probably won't. But try to connect the, the way the electricity works to the way your neurons work. I think that would make it a little more interesting. Okay, I'm going to take a break here and do another section of this lecture in part two.